content of the <laughs> presentation. So, yep. Personalization. Why do I think it's like detective work? Well, but before you start thinking about personalization for a, for a website or app, um, you need to start thinking about gathering out evidence. So drawing up a list of likely suspects who might be responsive to a personalized message. Using forensics, which in the case of people who are webmasters, we'll be looking at web analytics to find out what pages people are looking at, what parts of you know, people are into, interacting with, where they're dropping off, and um, where they're finding the content they like to engage with and maybe convert. And of course, interpreting suspect motivation and predicting behaviour. So this is when kind of behavioural psychology starts to come into it, understanding that the way that people use site search, for example, might indicate that they're a certain part of the buying cycle, whether they're going to buy a product, or whether they're just browsing. The personalization as a um, obviously big industry topic, but there seems to be a bit of ambivalence amongst people that people are being personalized to, whether they like it or not. So there have been a, a number of um, studies, at least some of the stats. Adobe found that only 33% of users thought that personalization was valuable. Another study said that, this is by a company called Larish and Sakes, found that while 37% of users do appreciate it being targeted, 31% of people just don't want to be targeted. 57% of online consumers are comfortable with providing online personal information as long as they feel it's for their benefit and it's being used in um, responsible ways. And Harry's talk is a good example there of overzealous behavioural targeting that follows all of us around the web, which I would argue is possibly not the, the best type of uh, example of using people's information and reflecting content back at them. 77% would trust businesses more if they explained how they're using this personal information to um, improve their online experience. So things like when you get a cookie pop up, everybody's pretty comfortable with, they understand what a cookie pop up is, and maybe they understand why they want additional pieces of inf information that they, they ask you to give away about yourself. Interestingly, businesses that do personalise web experience, see average of 19% increase in sales, according to um, marketing profs. 71% of companies currently at the moment are personalising their websites. Personalised emails definitely do work. They get a 29% increase in open rates and a 41% high click through rate. Um, so there is an opportunity, um, but there's a bit of a, a sort of split here between consumers who don't like being aggressively marketed to. Um, or the field that we market to and tactics that are actually working. So here's my definition of personalization. <coughs> Excuse me, there's probably hundreds out there. So, but my way is, is making, and I'll underline things that I think are important here, making a judgment about adding a level of appropriate familiarity in your treatment of your customer that is designed to reduce friction and perhaps inculcate delight. You notice there, I don't use the word sales in any of that. I think that's the, the key point. It's about, it's about saying, we know some stuff about you, and we're going to use it in a sensitive way that is going to make you more comfortable with interacting with the brand. Actually, it might make you feel a little bit better about us. And if you buy some stuff from us, that's a happy outcome. It's not the main objective that we're using to, to do this stuff for you. And I think when we should start thinking about how, in the offline world, um, where does that little personal touch make a big difference? So, you know, you might go to a pub and meet a mate of yours, and a pint of something you like is waiting for you. You can't anticipate that, but it's a nice touch. Everybody does it. Or you go into a store, and you go and say, I'm going to a, I'm going to a party, I'm going to an event, and the shopkeeper starts making recommendations um, on accessories or on things that might work with it, and perhaps may start recommending items for you that aren't the most expensive thing in the shop because they're actually things that will look better on you. Or you go into a shop and somebody wraps up a gift for you without even asking if it's a present. So in digital lives, we need to find you know, that same um, attention to detail and level of care, how do we do that? 
So here's a peer review thoughts on what personalization is not. Um, and I think a lot of people still believe it's yet another excuse for interactive marketing. So if you think um, when we had the social media explosion uh, in the last for sort of five, six, seven years, I used to go to conferences and I used to see award-winning pieces of social media, which were blatantly advertising or bribery. So it's either a, you know, enter this competition and um, win this product, or we're just going to find the sexy way to send this send this product. It's not actually interacting with a community of users or with your brand. It's just a clever way using a different channel to flog stuff to you. I don't care that as social media, just count that as another form of interactive marketing. <coughs> what it's also not is an over-reliance on gaining a single transaction at the expense of making a meaningful connection. So I thought you could win the battle but lose the war. I.e. you can make it very easy for somebody to buy one particular product. But these are pretty shitty experience. They feel like they've been rinsed and you've lost an opportunity to, to perhaps connect, make a connection between yourself as the brand and uh, the user as the customer that could lead to a, a longer term relationship where um, rather than you chasing a single tra transaction, you start thinking about um, how you're engaging with, with, a, with a customer over an entire life cycle. And what it's not is also bucketing everybody into off-the-shelf personas. Personas are great, important sport stepping stone in the, um, on the road to personalization, but it doesn't mean that all personas per are, are going to work for all users. <coughs> and each off-the-shelf persona is different necessarily going to work for your customers. What it's also not is hoping to provide a completely bespoke experience for every individual in each situation. Totally unattainable, probably not desirable. The other thing is copying your competitors and expecting it to work for you. Even Amazon are not 100% like. So earlier I just showed you an example of something that I got shown by Amazon recently. I bought a condenser microphone and I bought Lego. For my son, I'm highly likely to buy Lego, but I'm not very likely to buy a condenser microphone. But the association is I can buy these types of products. Two, two completely different products that you will buy, perhaps once every couple of years, or perhaps once every couple of years. <coughs> there are also intrinsic risks with presentation. Um, this is quite a famous case study from a company in the US called Target. Does anybody everybody know this one? Yeah, so if anybody not know it, Anybody not know? Right, okay, so just for, I'll explain. So the uh, Target's a US retailer. They collect a lot of information on um, customers through um, you know, various loyalty programs and so on. Um, they found a particular customer that they would make out vouchers for, for um, pregnancy um, products. And the girl's dad opened the post and hit the roof because she'd been targeted with um, some, some messaging about pregnancy, where obviously it was inappropriate. Actually, they knew that she was pregnant before he did. So it became quite an interesting story for me in the New York Times. The other risk is filter bubbles, where you just only simply reinforce a, a very narrow area of interest, um, rather than thinking, actually, you know, this user um, might be interested in some of their other products that are not even necessarily very, very closely related. <coughs> and all we're doing is consistently exposing them to the same types of product, service or experience. And you can end up with a kind of very narrow reinforcement um, of just, you know, this, product, this person who likes this type of product. And the other thing is, you know, algorithm doing this kind of stuff algorithmically, what algorithms don't do, you want to see, you are going to need to apply human implosion science some kind of common sense. So some good personalization side of us. My device is a, is, a, is a fairly straightforward one to start with. So tailoring content based on, it's pretty easy to pick up with somebody on a desktop or a mobile phone. Um, tailoring offers an image based on previous behavior. So it's a good, a good starting point. But again, you know, maybe just do that once and, and test out what the response rate, rate is like for that. And can factor in that certain types of products are, are more likely to be um, 
more bored in a kind of re refreshing pattern, and some probably won't be bored over a period of time. Facilitate browsing without people actually buying, so allow people to do, um, do searches, allow people to get to the point of um, gathering information, but not necessarily having to make a purchase or visit. Allowing users to save basket items for later, especially across device. And sending offers. So, for example, if you bought a camera, <coughs> something like don't forget your batteries. Um, lots of people can be subjected to quite aggressive upselling and cross selling. But that's an example of something that doesn't come across in a aggressive upsell. So, just a few tips here on um, a, a, a quick process to get started with personalization. First of all, get a good toolkit. So, um, if you're doing web based personalization, Using a JavaScript based testing and personalization software tool, it's pretty straightforward. There's a lot of tools in the market, some of them pretty low cost, like Optimizely, Visual Website Optimizer, Tate, and so on. You don't have to go to one of the big boys like Adobe. You can do a lot of this stuff yourself. Um, start factoring in data from exit surveys, so using things like Polaroot, um, there are several other tools, or even specialist. Um, offer tools like Bunting to test different offers to different user groups. Start with definitions. So, within your business, where do you think that a more personalised service will fit in? So, um, not everything that you're going to be doing is going to be appropriate. There will be some areas where more personalised services will be appropriate. So, gather data, things like People are using it to wish this. What products are they doing? How quick, how long is it before they come back and then look or purchase those products? Which products are people um, sharing amongst the user group, user group part of social media? Which products are people adding to uh, favourites? Which products are people looking at for uh, and reading the reviews of? <coughs> Do you have a save for later feature? Which are the products are people going back to? And then, obviously, read really reviews that people use about your products or service and act upon them, especially the bad ones. Where should it appear on your site if you do personalization? So, politics will tell you where users are making um, or abandoning your site. And something like Google Analytics, for example, will give you very good clues on which are your most valuable pages or funnels and you know which areas within that are uh, the ones that have. Uh, are the most value to you, your business. Site search within Google Analytics will give you an indication of the most searchable products or product types. And GMP data will give you your biggest locations. So from there, you've got a lot of information about um, a location, about product types, about particular pages that you're running personalization, personalization campaigns on. User studies, um, something I assume you guys are doing a lot anyway. Um, but also um, you know, using things like exit interviews with people, using, using tools like Qualaroo or some of the other, um, or SurveyMonkey, some of the other survey tools. Um, moderated studies based on offer psychology. And test, look, test the levels of familiarity until you find what is the right level, what's intrusive, um, um, what's appropriate for your brand, because it would be different between different brands. And then test a few things out. So, um, a, B, split all multivariate tests of strap lines, of um, offer pricing, of the images that you're using, um, of the, the cross-sell or the upsell, combinations of different products or types of offers, and then time since um, purchase for, for <coughs> the target of carry made one of these, but made a point earlier on about um, users being nudged. You know, if for certain products and certain services, they might be require a nudge very, very quickly. Certain users might require a, a, a fairly frequent nudge. Other user groups, you might put them in a bucket that says, actually, we're only going to contact them every two months or something like that. But you need to test that to work out which is the best time period and the optimal time period. And then finally, afterwards, analyze and reflect, tweak and iterate, and that, repeat and do it again. So, wrapping up some common personalization techniques, um, recontact users for a review after they've bought a product. Um, 
Amazon did this fairly successfully. I don't always leave a review. Sometimes I do. So have you bought this product from me? What do you think about it? How would you like to rate it? <coughs> Test when is the safest time for uh, recontact. Is it probably within three days, three weeks? <coughs> Look at times of day for email companies. And also sending by, by time zone rather than configuring if you're doing an email recontacting campaign, sending it all out. 8 p.m. GMT. <coughs> um, use your customers' names for emails, um, but also use real people's names um, from your own company to make it one-to-one. -one. So if you get a personal email from someone with a business you want to know. Um, personal recommendations based on um, purchase history. And a capture conversion by holding products in the basket and then sending a follow-up email. So he you were going to buy this, you haven't bought it, you still want it? That's, that's, that's worked for me, it doesn't work for everybody, of course. But, but um, you know, that little reminder that you still got the product in the basket, it's pretty useful to, to use. And then things if you're doing advertising, use leverage the power of things like Facebook advertising for more tailored experience. Um, you know, Facebook, Facebook is a, an aggressive marketer in lots of ways, but it does have lots of information about um, users and it has incredibly high click-through rates and conversion rates, purely because it does know a lot about um, a lot of stuff about, uh, about customers, so advertisers can tap into that. So finally, just, just to wrap, personalization presents a great opportunity to build customer relationships, but don't, don't even consider total personalization because it's possible and maybe not even desirable if, if um, we as uh, people who have built websites and built experience with people know uh, before people um, they want to maybe that's the right thing. Um, your customers will give you data on how, where, when, and why they want to be personalized, and it's just taking teasing that information out of the data. And then finally, honesty and transparency. Don't be a bullshitter. Anybody's interested? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thanks, Jeff.